Jij bent niet van suiker gemaakt. You are not made of sugar. Yeah. The idea that you effectively that argument says I'm so uncomfortable with being out in the world that I have to wear a coat made of car. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we didn't wear coats of cars until 50 years ago, well, 70 years ago. The whole of human history hasn't worn coats of cars. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman and that is Kylie Van Dam from Houten in the Netherlands. Uh, Houten is the village just outside of Utrecht that I visited uh, on my last visit to the Netherlands. And uh, Kylie actually reached out to me and said, hey, uh, wonderful that you profiled uh, getting out to Houten and uh, the village. Uh, would you mind? hearing from somebody who actually lives here. And I'm like, heck yeah. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy this conversation with Kylie. I am absolutely delighted to welcome into the Active Towns podcast, Kylie. Kylie, welcome. Hello, hello world. <laughs> so uh, Kylie, I'd love to have my uh, guest just give a quick introduction. So uh, please uh, share with the audience, who is Kylie? Uh, Kylie is an Australian uh, woman, lived in Australia and England for 20 years, each country over 40 years. And now for the last 12 years, we live in the Netherlands. And uh, we came here for cycling. Uh, we came here for cycling mentality. We came here for cycling culture. And we came here to live in and bring our children up in a society that thinks the way we do, as in people are more important than, for example, cars. So the whole thing about slow traffic, about family, about the values of how a human needs to function each day. And in Australia and England, we never really found ways to satisfy those needs. And then we came here and we found a whole country that was doing it and thought, we really have to live there. Luckily, we could. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. And what was the connection with with the Netherlands why was it just random or no <clears throat> colonial history okay. uh, so my after you know gets a lot of people traveling around the world yeah after the war a lot of Dutchies left the Netherlands and they went to Australia and they went to uh, South Africa and Canada I think and my father-in-law who turned 80 last year he was one of their family was one of the families that left the Hague and they went to Australia and uh, because of that then we have Dutch passport in the in the family okay uh, so we always wanted to live in England my husband and I we found ourselves there separately got together there blah blah had children but as a for me I can only speak for myself but as an Australian I found myself more comfortable in Europe because okay. of the kind of more social way of thinking about things. Right. And then we realized after a long period of time, having gone to the Netherlands every couple of years or every year for a holiday with the kids, and we'd kind of go, oh, we want to be here. And mm -hmm. we used to get homesick. We used to come back to England and get homesick for the Netherlands, kind of okay. real sadness. And then we realized, okay, we just got to do that. Right, right. Wow. Okay. So... Uh, and how many years ago was that? That was 12 years ago. 12 so years we, ago. So we shifted back from London to Australia in 98. We didn't like it in Sydney and we shifted back from Sydney to London two and a half years later. Okay. So then we were in London for four years and then Norwich for six years and now here for 12 years. Okay. There for 12 years. And where is here? Oh, here. Here is... Oh, a magical place. Here is a place called Houghton. Houghton mm -hmm. is a purpose-built cycling. I've just dropped my lights. Hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Houghton is a purpose-built cycling city that was developed. The first discussions began in the mid-70s, late mm -hmm. 70s. Planning permissions were given, the given the zoning permissions. And my house, for example, comes from 1983. Okay. So it's a town that prior to then had a small old village of about 3,000 people. And the government earmarked it as a part of the country for housing development. And it had to shift up to 50 to 60,000 people. Right. 
by 2020, I think that was the plan. So we live in this, I'm looking here, I'm try, I should have found this for you actually. I'm trying to find an illustration of Houghton. Ah, it's, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you've got anything. But well, let me show you like, what I do have. Um, yeah, let's show see, me what you because do you, you because you sent this to me. <laughs> I've got a oh, few things go. here. I've got go. uh, yeah. yeah. So so this is you know these are obviously from a book that you have uh, there, and these are some of the you know the illustrations, and you get an idea. Yeah. So I mean, so exactly right. And 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 I've been to Houghton a couple of times. And in fact, that's how you and I got connected was I had actually posted my YouTube video of me riding from Utrecht out to Houghton because it's a very, very, it's a delightful ride and it's not very far. Um, How many minutes does it typically take? It's six Ks if you're like me and a little slow sometimes and don't ride enough that kind of distance, which because I live in Houghton, so everything is yeah. local, so I don't ride a lot. And also, I've uh, well, we can talk about that later, but I have some long COVID, so I haven't ridden properly for a year. But that's usually about a 30 minute ride. My husband used to do it day in, day out before COVID, and that was he could do it in 25 minutes, but he's got legs got up to here, so yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. he's really tall. <laughs> But it's a beautiful ride. And when I saw that film, I just, I, was, I love that ride. I didn't tell you about this, but there's a, a German television program. It's on my website. And it was filmed just before COVID. And a, a German film crew came here and they filmed for two days in Houghton, in Utrecht. And then they filmed that ride that you did with a drone. So, so when you so when you came from Utrecht and then you hit the open fields and you, you traveled along the train line, and then it's kind of really open and rural. And then suddenly, bam, you're in Houghton. They filmed that with a drone. And I had my little red coat on. I was a little red riding hood kind of uh, cycling through the meadows. It's the most beautiful ride. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the images that, that, that you have when you're making that, that ride uh, from Utrecht into Houghton is you end up passing over uh, a major roadway you know, a, a highway. And, and this is what that kind of looks like as you're, as you're making that route over there. And I comment on that is, is, is that it's, it's so wonderful that you, there is that high quality by walking and biking, and then you can arrive by transit. But if you're driving and, and many of the residents do drive and have cars, uh, you, you, you are on the, the ring road and then you can access your residence or close to your residence park. And then from that point forward, you're, you're walking and biking. Now, Kylie, this just sounds utopian. <laughs> I got to tell you, you know, one of the reasons I want to talk about this stuff is because you're absolutely right. Around the world, this concept feels utopian. And, you know, we, we see people responding to it. There are people like you, like uh, Bicycle Dutch, like Dutch Cycling Embassy, like Not Just Bikes, who are trying to put this utopia back into the world of possibilities and real options because people are so inundated or so saturated, sorry, by the idea and saturated in the idea that that's something that is not possible for the modern world. And my whole pitch, it is entirely possible. In fact, it's futuristic. When Robert Derricks and his colleagues and the politicians at the time proposed this notion of Houghton, and you've nailed it on the head there, from the very beginning, Robert Derricks talks about something called the inversion theory, so that when he and his fellow planners were planning Houghton, The inversion, the notion of the inversion comes from not you begin with the car traffic and then build the facilities and livability around the car traffic. The inversion is that you build the green and the people first. Last year, I was helping Robert do an interview with a student from London School of Economics, and she was from Beijing, you know, her master's, exactly, that's greenery. And she was saying to him, how did you keep the car out? And he looked at her and kind of said, I don't understand the question. And she said, well, how did you stop the car becoming so dominant? And he said, the car was always dominant. The car car will always be dominant. So what I did was design it sort of without the car, knowing the car would find its way in. 
and this is this is my pictures and 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 to state for your listeners and viewers i am not a planner i am not a professional i do not come from this background whatsoever i am a person who lives in a space and goes do i feel human in this and do i not and from the very beginning it was obvious this layout was a kind of treasure chest of thoughts and values. And at that center of treasure, tre treasure chest, the very physical building of that treasure chest and values were people. And it distilled from the very beginning, not distilled, it broke apart from the very beginning when you're here. You realize that you as a human being, you, your children, so, so humans at the age of two, right up to 102, were the pivotal points of this design. And the car, the notion that the car equals freedom and uh, the self-reliability that people think the car brings, it wasn't even part of the discussion. And this was this is obvious when you when you physically stand in this environment. I knew none of this technically, theoretically. I didn't know any of the people who were involved in any of this. All I did was be in that space and thought, I'm welcome here. And not only am I welcome here as a human being, I'm celebrated here. And my children are celebrated. And my 95-year-old grandparents are celebrated here. Yeah, yeah. And it is su such a powerful experience. And I suppose this is my, my biggest thing about wanting to speak to you or anybody else working in this industry, is I want people coming here because I know even the most engaged, technically aware person, even your bicycle doctors, even your not just bikes, even you yourself, this theory is known. You know, people can think this through and go, people, people are, shouldn't be with cars, la, la, la. But it's not until you are physically here. And I don't know if it's like your experience, but I see it again and again and again. When people are physically here, you see the brain go, oh. Oh, yeah. I feel it. I smell it. I hear it. I feel it in my shoulders from the stress, the danger, the confrontation, agitation that we have when we're living in these car-focused societies. And as an Australian and person in 20 years, I know what that is. To come into this space where people are the priority and not whatever the narrative is that makes cars dominant, not that. Yeah, yeah. So my biggest thing is I want you, <laughs> I want you, John, yeah. I want you and I want anybody else who is either thinking about this or trying to affect change because I know that's the biggest thing, yeah. trying to affect change, trying to affect change in the mentality, in the zeitgeist, in the way people think, they need to come here. Not because I'm saying build Houghton, because that's not possible, is it? I mean, lots, most, most people who are trying to work for planning are trying to retro plan. They're trying to mm -hmm. plan in somewhere that's already existing in some kind of way. They don't have the privilege of starting from scratch. But when they come here, what becomes noticeable is not so much the infrastructure, but more of what the infrastructure does for an individual, for physical and mental health. And for the community, it's very, very powerful. And so when I saw your, am I, am I ranting here? So when no. I saw your, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this subject. So when I saw your video, that's why I made contact saying, let's talk. Because this is what, what I've got for you. Well, and it's so important, too, because, you know, as as, as an outsider who was introduced to Houghton um, in 2018 as part of study tour with people yeah, for bikes and representatives from uh, 10 other different cities uh, was there. I was there as an embedded um, videographer. Yeah. I was documenting them experiencing that environment, yeah. but it was the first time that I had had the opportunity to visit Houghton. And uh, it was it was truly, truly special because it was like, OK, cool. We're able to see a relatively new development. And when I say relatively new, um, you know, I'm not I'm talking about a place that exists now and, and, and it was built within, you know, 
post-World War II. So we're not talking historic Utrecht. This is or, not a museum. Or, 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 yes, exactly. It's not a museum. I mean, this was no. a, a planned, designed, intentional development and, and and it was very and that was why it was so cool to be able to have those drawings and be able to see that you know sort of that plan that exists there, and I'm pretty sure that that this gentleman uh, was the person who we met with and he you know was able to uh, you know to help us out and I'm going to zoom out so we can get his full picture here, yeah. So uh, who is this? Who's this guy who we we met? This is our man. This When you said uh, you were here with a tour, I was about to go, I hope you met Andre. So this is Andre Botamons. He is a planner and he has worked here in Houghton with the council for uh, since 2001, I think. He also has a, a dual function as the cycling ambassador for Houghton. And he does exactly what you just described. He uh, facilitates tours here for all sorts of people. Anyone who wants to come and understand Houghton technically, historically, physically, he is your man. You contact him through the council and he will counsel, he will organize tours and, and take you around. Um, he's great. He's passionate. He understands the value of what we have here. And he's passionate about getting the message out across the world. And I want to pick up on what you said there, this thing about it's post-war. It's not only post-war, it's actually only 50 years old, what we know as Houghton now. And that is the, the little map you showed earlier was the northern part of Houghton. So that was the first growth, what they call the first growth task. The second growth task, and I presume you rode down there as well, was in the south of Houghton. The south of Houghton is still being built. And what's astounding about that to me, and Andre was part of all of that, uh, what's astounding about that to me is that it is plainly obvious that as you go down into the south of Houghton, it looks like any suburb I imagine you might have in America. You know, it's modern, it's got cars, it's got its houses and its smart streets, it's modern living, but fundamentally, the car does not dominate. And the concepts, the, the, the primary concepts about people, about children, what people talk about now nostalgically as in, oh, remember the days when I had scabs on my knee? Oh, remember the days when my mum would call me in at you know, dark to have dinner? This is now. There is no nostalgia there. There is no history there. There is no museum there. This has been still built now. So that this model that people say cannot function, you can't, you can't have a modern society without the car dominating, is at worst a lie and at best, best a kind of absorbed mistruth, <laughs> you know? So Andre, Andre does all of that. Yeah, yeah. And that brings us around to, you know, part of the mistruths and this this um, sort of giving up to uh, mobility, cars as mobility and cars as a way of life and cars mm. as uh, as addiction and dependency uh, gets manifested in a couple of other um uh, influences. Now you mentioned uh, Bicycle Dutch, uh, the wonderful YouTube uh, channel um, uh, Mark, with Mark Wachenberg. I, I probably mispronounce his name. Wachenberg. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, so we've got Bicycle Dutch, we've got Not Just Bikes. Uh, we also, you mentioned um, the, the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Uh, we also have, you know, Marco and uh, Thalia have, have the, the new book Movement. And, and so that's a, a fabulous, uh, you know, very, very high level, you know, exploration into the challenges that we have to be able to take back our streets and transform our lives. And then we also have this beautiful book by my good friends, uh, Melissa and Chris Bruntlett, who live right there in Delft. And I think these two books, this one in particular, there were certain chapters in this uh, that really dove into the different types of cities. And in particular, I think you resonated with a, a couple of different, you know, aspects of this book. But talk a little bit more about gender and the the things that, you know, kind of came to life for you and became quite evident, uh, not only after you moved to Houghton, but also when you had a chance to read this book and, and the light bulb sort of was illuminated for you. 
I think this is a stunning book. I, I'm absolutely smitten by both of those books. Um, that particular book, what impressed me is, we've, we've touched upon this already, is to be a great theoretician, to understand it, to intellectually comprehend it and go, of course you want space for people. Of course people aren't cars and don't go so fast. Of course. But this book, very bravely and honestly and generously, articulates the moments when two really smart, uh, professionally understanding people actually got it. I mean, really got it. And it felt incredibly intimate to me. I have to say, I read sort of everything. Sometimes I had to put it down going, whoa, were these people living in my underwear? You know, I mean, it was so, so intimately uh, comprehending. They really got it. I don't know, and I have to have faith that somebody who hasn't had my experiences or our experiences in the transition, who doesn't understand the, the moment of click from, from, a, from one way of living to another, I have to have faith that whatever they've been able to articulate in the book doesn't just resonate with me, but with other people who haven't had those experiences like I have. There were, it's just again and again, I just kept writing to poor Chris going, oh my God, you nailed it. Oh my God, you got it. You know, I, the poor guy, he got spammed. But the, one of the ones that really uh, resonated was, of course, Melissa talking about the female experience as a, as a cyclist. And I had forgotten. I had forgotten that. In, I didn't ride until I was 33, I think, 33 or so. And I started to learn to ride in London which is a madness to say. But I had my first baby. I didn't go to the gym. I wanted to be active and I wanted to be outside and I wanted to have my body back as my own. So I thought, oh, I'll give a, a bike a, a try. And I started doing that in London. And then we shifted out to Norwich and then we could have, which is two hours northeast and just less manic than London. And then we could have a trailer with the baby in and we could ride everywhere. And I just wanted to ride because it was then my time. And I didn't want my babies. Yeah, that's, oh, that's my tray, one of the trailers. That's us clearing out the shed. When we, got, when we cleared out the shed and I went to the tip, you call it the refuse center or something. I'm not sure what, what in, in America it's called. And I didn't have a car. So uh, that's how we did it. But the, the notion that as a woman, this thing about protection, I don't know what it is, the, the, the wearing the metal coat of the car to protect you and the children. And what it does is dislocate you from society. It also dislocates you from your own body. And suddenly you have to go and buy time at the gym to be physically active. And that just made absolutely no sense to me. I wanted to be in my body moving. I wanted my kids out in the world, seeing the world, smelling it. Yes, smelling it and feeling it. This is when we shifted to uh, the Netherlands. So we've got there the Rasters, who was 10 months old then, or about a year. And then Abby just turned six and Mia was seven and a half. Uh, yeah, and they loved it. There's another shot there. I don't know if you're going to use it. And uh, there's another shot there of the, yeah, well, that's now them older. So now, and this is my favorite shot. You talked a moment ago about the car. And the thing about what the car promises, you know, those adverts we see on television with it's late night and there's some sexy man. Women have always got kids in the car, but some sexy man driving through the city, nobody around. He's free. Look at the face, you know, happy. The look on those children's faces, that is the face that they try to sell in those car adverts. And I love that. You see that on babies everywhere, babies in, in, in trailers which is what my children had in England. But babies in trailers here on bike seats, they sing, they've got the wind in their face, la, 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 like this. It's an utter, utter joy. And going back to Norwich, I wanted that for my kids and for myself. So I started riding and I became known as the, the cycling mummy. I mean, what? And there's a reason I'd forgotten that, because that doesn't exist here. I mean, what would be the equivalent here? I haven't got a clue. I mean, even if, even if men here ride the women's bike, you know, where we come from, where I come from, there would have been a woman's bike because it would have the, the bike seats. It would have pink carriers. I don't know what it would define it as female. That doesn't exist here. Right. You've got a bike on which you can get your kids to and from school until they're old enough to go and do it themselves. Simple. Yeah. 
So when Melissa said that in her book, and I thought, whoa, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> you know, and I know that a lot of your viewers and listeners are probably thinking, what is she talking about? Of, of course, that's the way it is. It doesn't have to be. And that's not theory. That's reality in this country. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I think it's so incredibly empowering for children to be able to have <gasps> that level of mobility and, uh, and, and, and develop uh, the sense of confidence and efficacy, self-efficacy. But then it also extends out to uh, our older generations as well. Having that Absolutely. ability, having mobility uh, is, is so yeah. incredibly important. Do you know, I really don't like social structures that separate people in that way and that prioritize one over the other so that there is the norm, for example, car drivers. And then there are others and there are different levels of others. There are little children, there are medium-sized children. There are older people, there are people with disabilities, there are immigrants. So suddenly all these, these titles and these levels become something that is not of equal value to whatever the dominant is. In this, well, I ha I, when I say this country, I live in Houghton. I don't live in this country. I live in where I live. And here, you have no distinction there. What you have is people moving from A to B. People enjoying being active, people enjoying being independent, people talking to each other, people in control of their day. I love this photograph because I think that many people around the world, for, for them, this is surprising to see this. This lady, I don't know her personally, I've spoken to her a couple of times, and she also, uh, she works for an organization re requires her to shift furniture uh, from place to place. I think it might be a um, charity or something. And she has a normal bike with a trailer on the back, quite a low slung trailer. And she'll be pulling couches or tables or whatever. Nobody bats an eyelid because it's just somebody doing something. Sometimes I see on the threads that occur, the discussions that occur, you know, by um, Dutch Cycling Embassy will put something up and and there will be a photo of this kind of thing. And I mean, I don't need to tell you and a lot of people who are interested in your content that this would draw out comments such as, oh, she doesn't have a helmet. Oh, she's going to get hurt on those skates. Oh, what if that old lady has a heart attack? Oh, what if other 70-year-olds are not fit enough to pedal up? I mean, it's just rubbish. It, and, and I'm sorry to dismiss I know, I know this is a bad statement. Sorry to dismiss the way people respond to that, but their response is that they can't see it because it's not what they know, and therefore they dismiss it. And the fact that this whole country functions in this way, to many people, is not reality. And this photo is a really great example of it's just moving. Yeah. It's, it's just people moving at people's space. People pay, sorry, you stick a car in there and it's dangerous. You remove a car or a vehicle at speed, a great big heavy metal thing, it's not dangerous anymore. <laughs> I want to I want to take us back to this image because we didn't really get to chat about it, but I think it's powerful because this this is actually the downtown station area. This is uh, the the centrum, the center of the, the the city, the village itself. And so, you know, when we look at some of the other images of the greenery, and like you said, it starts with the green first, and and then works its way in. Literally everything, the entire village, is within easy biking distance. In many cases, most cases, even walking distance to this location, and this is where the train, this is where you know transit drops you off. Talk a little bit about the, you know, <laughs> this area and 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 how magical it is to be able to have that combination of, you know, there are single family ho houses even in that area, uh, but you also are very very close to all of this. 
I am aware that we are having this conversation in the shadow of the explosion caused by this term, the 15-minute city. I'm aware that that has allowed some people to express opinions that say that the 15-minute city is the instrument of all that is bad and evil. What is, I just, so... (laughs) <laughs> it's all it's we're both flabbergasted because it's it's actually so ridiculous that you're just like what I, I understand absolutely- why I understand the context of 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 how that yeah. came out and it came out of the UK uh and okay. I understand the context of it because of the um the belief that there could be a controlling mechanism yeah. to yeah, it yeah. and and so we, we, we don't need to get into the, the nitty no. gritty of that conspiracy theory, but the reality of what this means for you and your family is that you are able to live that concept of a five minute city, a 10 minute city, a 15 minute city. My son yeah. is 13. He came, he goes to school in town. Actually that building on the right that you see there behind the uh, children's wagon, his school is behind there. And for him to ride home from there is a one and a half minute ride for his P13 year old. This is, this is not because we're rich. And I want to point that out. This is not because we are rich and we are buying a privileged way of life. This is because this urban design allows everybody of every economic uh, capacity to live this kind of life. And it means that my son is independent and has been for, well, he's 13 now, so, I mean, you know, years. And he will ride home by himself. He then dropped his school bag, and then he took himself to the orthodontist, which is another minute behind that building. And then should he need it, opposite there, he could go to his doctor, all within all within a five-minute cycle of this house. Yeah, so that's our main bike path, and that's the beautiful tower from the council house. It has a carol on the, you know, the, the musical uh, bells, they'll play ABBA or Fiddler on the Roof or all sorts of weird songs, you know, every hour. You just go, hang on, am I listening to Hello by Lionel Richie? What is this? It's 11 o'clock. So the 15-minute city, and, and Robert Derricks, the designer, has talked about the 15-minute city, the fact that he, his design, he wanted it so that from north to south, the most you had to ride was 15 minutes. And that was a decision made upon research at the time, saying that people will ride for 15 minutes, but more than that, they'll get in the car. So then if you keep everything accessible, it doesn't mean you have to exit a padlocked gate to go into some foreign community on the other side of your 15 minutes. It just means everything is accessible to you for 15, within 15 minutes. Yeah. It's the most logical community-based structure I have ever lived in. And far from feeling claustrophobic, it's absolutely liberating. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you mentioned two things. You mentioned, you know, that you're, you're, you're not necessarily of this, you know, massively wealthy, privileged uh, group. What do you do for a living? Oh, that's a good point. Thank you for asking. I am a musical language educator. So what does that mean? It means that I teach little Dutch kids from age four up to about age 12 sometimes. I teach them English through music and I write the music that I teach them through. So this is my website and we put this up on the whiteboard. I have YouTube, so I create pages on my website with links and I teach via their boards and then they can go home and sing it with mummy and daddy. I've had videos of mummy and daddy playing from this website in the car where they drive to wherever and they have to sing, I've got a mozzie bite on my bottom all the way down to the south of France. So that's what I do. I also, as a, as a singer songwriter, I also create content for adult performances and so I also develop you know adult sort of semi cabaret stuff not sexy bexy cabaret but just storytelling cabaret so you know while I've had long covid and I say that because that's my job as a I teacher but I've not taught for a year uh, because of long covid but when I do teach yeah that's that's what I'm doing yeah 
Yeah. And, and here's your YouTube channel and oh, yeah. that is accessible right from the, the website there. And uh, so folks, uh, you can, you can pop on over there and check that out. And, and the other neat thing about your, your, your website here too, is that y- you also have uh, your passion uh, in, in your non-music stuff. And so uh, in, in you, like I said, you earlier, you're very, very passionate about uh, where you're living, but you also are, have taken the time to, you know, put posts out about, you know, other things that really interest you, uh, including exciting cycling recommendations. Uh, so talk a little bit more about all this. Okay. So I don't know when it was 16, 17, 18, I ended up being able to write an article in the guardian about how to, Oh, it was as a result, they had a section called Fram, family friendly cities. And there was a lot of nostalgia and a lot of, oh, wouldn't it be fantastic? And, oh, it doesn't exist. And, 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 I, and I just thought, please, people, this is crazy. So I contacted them with actually a video from Mark Wachenbuer from Bicycle Dart. And we ended up creating an article about it. Since that article, which you can still view called Cycle Heaven, you can still see the article. And as a result of that article, I've been able to have contact with different people in the cycling industry and contribute in different ways, like filming with the German crew for two days, the BBC, we had an interview on Radio 4, this with you. And if I do anything, and obviously we've just had the pandemic for some time and now I've been ill, but if we do things, I will park that stuff there. And then people could go and have a look and see what they're like. Yeah. And we can see, you know, some of, uh, some of your work right here. And I just, I find it so incredibly refreshing that a, that we were able to, to strike up this conversation, you know, over the internet based on the, the video that I, that I shot and being able to uh, and I started to say this earlier is that, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm an outsider. I, I'm somebody who has, have visited multiple times now, but I'm still somebody from the outside being fascinated by the fact that Houghton exists and was planned and is designed. It's so special to be able to talk with somebody who lives there and really understands and appreciates how special it is because it's another thing. There's many times I'm, I'm having, having these discussions with uh, Dutchies that are like, Oh my gosh, I'm so you know grateful for your channel, for Jason's channel, not just bikes, because we're, we're like, becoming aware how special this is. You know how special it is because you live I know how elsewhere. Special it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know how special it is. And I want to bring Houghton to the table as a tool. I want Houghton, for me, Houghton has some weight to carry. And it, it has weight to carry in your hands and in Bicycle Dutch hands and in not just bike hands and in street films hands and in all sorts of people's hands because Either you, either you guys are reaching the people who are trying to make changes, politicians, influencers, people working in organizations, groups of influence to governments, etc. Or we get those government officials here. You know, either way, I think Houghton has a lot of weight to carry as a, as a um, precedent and as an absolute example that blows out of the water any of the language about it's not possible in today's world. That is wrong. And when you come to Houghton, you go, it's entirely possible. And not only is it entirely possible, actually, it's what we need for the future. And on that, I wonder, I wonder the, that image you have there, whoops, where am I? Can you see that? There you go. Yeah. And I've got that image actually. Um, so let's, let's pull that up because I've got the photo of that right yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, I wanted to talk to you about Houghton and I wanted to have a chat and a play. That's gorgeous. But this is one of the big things I want to talk to you about. This is a book called Het Groen Omarmd, and it means the green embraced. And you can see the name there, Robert Dirks. He is one of the pivotal designers of Houghton. So the ring road is his, the, the greenery is his, the inversion theory is his, the people-based uh, mentality is his. He's been in, involved in the project of Houghton for 40 years. And when he retired in 2010, 12, I think he closed his business 2012 as a planner. 
In 2010, he retired from the Technical University of Delft. And upon retirement, he effectively wrote down a document about Houghton and about his experience of Houghton and everything that went into creating this place. That's what this book is. This is gorgeous. Those illustrations, you have the content. And in discussions with him last year, I said to him, this has got to be in English. And he said to me, oh, do you think so? I said, absolutely. We need this as a roadmap for not only influencers, but planners, for students, for academics, for politicians, for everybody. We need them to be stimulated by Houghton itself. So it's just another way to tickle people. But it's also a really great way to show the process, discussions, the theory, the technicality, and the way that those are all still usable for today. As I said earlier, this is not a museum. This is a living city. Dutchies and Houghton do not need you or anybody else coming here to study them, They're just living their lives. I know England, Australia, America, India, China, everywhere, they need Houghton. And documents such as Het Groen om Art, all of this stuff contributes to the changing of the mindset. So we are currently working on this. Andre Boltemans and Robert and myself are currently trying to get this published in English. And it won't be exactly everything that's here because some of it, you know, the rest of the world doesn't need. But there's a lot of really great, interesting, exciting stuff and beautiful images. You know, we were, we've been lucky enough to have a work placement student from Germany uh, working with us on this project for the last six months. And he has just finished his undergrad in Germany. And I found him just kind of like staring at the illustrations and just trying to figure stuff out. And as a student, he was really interested in this. So this is a big project we have. One of the reasons I want to tell you this is that if there are any expressions of interest in the project, either interest as far as, oh, we'd love to buy it, or, oh, wow, I know a great publisher, or, wow, I know where to get some money to help you do that, please contact Andre Bautemans at Council. Uh, because because we would we want this to be as rich a document as possible, and we want it to travel as far and to land in as many places as possible. It's interesting too because uh, you know starting with the green parts first was is something it, it, that rang a bell for me and was quite familiar because it was something that uh, Victor Dover, a good friend of mine uh, from the the South Miami area said over and over and over again when I interviewed him. Uh, designing the, the city by starting with the green parts is especially important because you don't just start with the real estate. You you start with the parks and open space and uh, the preserve areas or the forested slopes or the green tree-lined streets and trails and greenways. And if you do that, then great addresses naturally shake out and then with the street design, that includes everything from the, the greenery around it, street trees and, and everything yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. And, and parks as well, you know, and making sure that you are able to, uh, for instance, uh, one of the big uh, pushes right now in North America is ensuring that every household is within a 10 minute walk to a green space and a park, uh, a trail. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's all in here, John. It's all in here. Um, that That's pivotal to the design process. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, the other thing that is just, you know, so incredibly important when you look at this design is that we are looking at the fact that still in North America and around the world, there's still plenty of greenfield developments. There's still communities yeah. that are being that are being designed from the ground up, but they're being designed with the 
expectation that uh, literally a motor vehicle yeah. is going to be able to drive everywhere, have complete access, uh, yeah. you know, throughout the, the village, throughout the development, throughout the city and right up to the doorstep of, of yeah. each household. And it, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's the beautiful thing that Houghton, you know, shows is that yeah. you can still have that mobility, that auto mobility, and you can still get to easy access to that highway that we saw earlier, easy access to, to places where, you know, transit can't get you to. And, and so it's not anti-car, but at the same no. time, it's it's very much pro-people, especially in the core. And this is this is really something, you know, to to make sure when I'm presenting, when people are presenting Houghton as a viable option for how to live, people in contemporary societies have bought so deeply into the notion that the car is the only way to give you autonomy. And to look at Houghton and say, you, we, all, we all have cars. Very few of us don't have cars. Some people even have two cars. What we do is we just use them less. So, so when we're going from our house to the shop, we don't get in a car. What we do is we get on a bike because we're moving our body and we can talk to the neighbors. Our children can move around us. It's, it just means that we're minimizing the use of the car and the impact of the car on ourselves and on our society and, of course, on our environment. And people probably think, what do you mean on a society, Kylie? Well, okay, this is a really great image. This is something called a singing bike path. So it was just, uh, you know, it, people realized there was discussions about when you're cycling, people feel so good. Lots of people want to sing, but of course they feel self-conscious about that. And, and you know, someone's coming the other direction and so oh, it's a bit weird. So the councils have put up these signs called singing bike path. On this bike path, just have a good sing. Uh, my, my girlfriend, you can see the lady in the front there on the three-wheeler. I don't know her, but my girlfriend is behind her in her wheelchair. She loves to sing. So she's in this shot just as happy as a pig in, let's call it excrement. And the, the, the thing about the social, you can see these people are smiling and laughing because they're together. They're talking, they're playing, they're sharing. Okay, this is a particular promotional event for the singing bike path. But when you go outside of our house, you say hi to your neighbors. In fact, my brother-in-law calls the type of Dutch bike like these people are on now. They call them, he calls them the hoi hoi bikes because in Dutch to say hi, you say hoi. On these bikes, you go past somebody, you don't just say hi, you go hi hi. You know, so you go hoi hoi. And, and uh, it, because it means that social bonds are made. Um, it means you get your happy chemicals from talking to people. Uh, you're out under in the light, whatever that light might be today, not so much. Some air in your lungs and some social engagement. The most basic things that human needs, humans need, that we often outsource for a gym or a club or an event. You don't need to do that. Just go out on your bike. Yeah, yeah. And that also was in uh, Chris and Melissa's uh, book is the social city is, is the fact that, you know, you do have those little micro moments of connectivity with the people around you, which you just don't get when you are trapped in a hermetically sealed metal box. And you're right to use the word micro, but they're actually, and, and there are micro engagements, but they're actually bigger engagements as well. Sure. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Because literally they could be just even super micro, like literally body language yep. of like, Absolutely. I'm going here. Uh, but it can be even more, like you said, you know, actually outwardly you know, saying, you know, hoi hoi. <laughs> so, so when we lived in Sydney, I learned to drive in London which is a pretty crazy place to drive in Camden, especially on a Saturday. The silly man took me there for like my second lesson in Camden, which if people don't know, it's madness. It's a, it's a street market filled with all the world's populations and I had to drive down it. So I thought I was a pretty good driver by the time I left there. Then we went to live in Sydney and we had the Sydney Harbour Bridge. This is death. This thing is scary as anything. And after two and a half years of driving that, Last day I got out of that car after driving, driving over the Sydney Harbour Bridge, I thought I never, 
ever want to do that again. And what I found in Sydney that was different to London. In London, everyone, of course, knows the rules. We follow the la la. But if somebody makes a mistake, you make eye contact, you have a little discussion together, and someone goes, yeah, all right, come on then. You go, oh, thanks, sorry about that, and you crack on. In Sydney, no. You know the rules. Everyone's got to do what they've got to do. And if you make a mistake, I'm going to wind my window down and scream at you and abuse you. Here in Houghton, what you do, you get on your bike and you ride around each other. And if you're in a really busy place, like I'm, I'm sure you know those areas, like there's a there's a, um, a main intersection in Utrecht with the Miffy lights. I don't know if you know that, but there's a zebra crossing that's multicolored. It is the busiest intersection in the Netherlands for cycles. And yet people manage it because they communicate with each other. So so when we were in Sydney, and I told my dad, who's a gorgeous man, by the way, um, and I told him about this this incident, for example, with a car, and he's like, yeah, well, if anyone knows the rules, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, and that's where I don't want to live. I want to live where I can have a conversation with somebody and not negotiate and get my own way, just have a conversation. And that's what happens here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing I was going to say there, sorry, I just remember what I want to say is with long COVID, um, you know, obviously different. Uh, I'm sure there are many listeners of yours who have similar experiences. But in the case of long COVID in this built environment, to begin with, of course, I was too ill to leave the house. And then I would leave the house for five minute walks or something. I could do all of that, even though my system was overwhelmed because I wasn't in a, I wasn't in a motorway. You know, I could go out quietly and I could talk to people. And as I've got stronger and I can go out further, I go out every single day. And one of the things about long COVID is, is mentally it's extremely challenging because you're, you're basically locked up in your body. And for somebody like me, I don't know if you can tell, I have a bit of life energy. And me being locked up in a body is not necessarily exactly. So this is where I walk. I walk around where you rode. You were riding on the left-hand side of that image. Every day, as somebody who is recovering from a very challenging illness, I go outside and I'm physically active, I'm safe, I'm, I'm not overstimulated. But I also speak to people, many of whom I know, but many of whom I don't know. And every day I speak to people about long COVID and I hear their stories. Right. And every day I probably hear of 80 to 85% of the people I speak to know somebody who has long COVID. They have experiences. They look at me in the eyes. They understand what I'm going through. And they say to me, oh, have you got this? Have you got that? Yes, my brother-in-law had this. Now, psychologically, as somebody recovering from an illness, the fact that this infrastructure allows me to go outside, be well, be safe, and interact with people has had a massive impact on both my physical and mental recovery in a way that, that I cannot even imagine in a society where I went from one house in a car to a shopping mall where I didn't know anybody to back in a car that I don't think I'd be functioning as well as I am now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, earlier you, you mentioned Utrecht and uh, yeah. in, in some of the, you know, the most busy uh, cycling intersection area and uh, the other uh, aspect of, of Utrecht that is incredibly famous right now is of course the canal that, Yes. Was previously uh, a, a, a canal, then a motorway, then back to a canal now. And uh, you, you sent along a little vi video here of uh, one of my favorite, you know, views. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to play this a little bit. I'll, I'll keep the sound low. Yeah. There's just some background noise uh, there, but I'll let you narrate this. Uh, sure. Why did you send this along and why is this a, a special visual that you wanted to share with everybody? Yeah, because, you know, we, since lunchtime, there were lots of Dutchies out for their walks from, uh, from their offices and things. Because we hear again and again and again that things are not possible. We hear again and again that that's just the way it is. Um, this is a modern world. You don't want to go backwards. Oh, it's a sign of the times. You, you know, you, what are you going to do? Turn communist? I don't know. It's, it's crazy. And this building project just indicated to me that I was in a country where adults were in 
power. You know, the adults were running the show. And what the adults said was, hey, we're going to do this because it's post-war and this is modern life. And so they did. They filled this canal in and they turned it into a, 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 a road multi-lane. Oh, that's my daughter, Abby. <laughs> she let me film. That was all right. I had permission. Uh, and so they did that. They decided to fill that in. And then I think it was late 90s or so, they realized, oh, actually, this is no good. And instead of going, oh, well, then we need more or we blah, 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 they said, oh, we got that wrong. Let's fix it. And they took it out. Yeah. That's what I find that beautiful, faith giving, just, just gorgeous to see that people in power would say, yeah, we got that wrong. And they fixed it. I, it's it, it's it's something I talk about all the time. It's like uh, a the, the 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 duchies are not afraid to try something, be innovative, and at the same time they're like, well, you know that didn't that didn't work. And a, even if it's an embarrassing major blunder that cost millions and millions of of euros, as it did in in that case, uh, they're like, you know, no, I mean. The, the cost to society is too high. The return on investment is too great. We need to turn this back into and create a more people-oriented place. And, and they did it. We hear again and again, ah, oh, the Netherlands has only got cycling because it's flat. Oh, they just, they just grew up like that. Oh, la, 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 la. What this event was an example of to me was the continuation of discussion. The Netherlands is not a cycling town because post-war, somebody had a bright idea, had so much power, took over the discussion, created cycling, everybody kind of got into it and we're sticking, sitting in a museum now. No, this is a constant discussion. One of the films that I showed you, Together We Cycle, uh, Fran, have you seen it? Oh yeah, multiple times, oh, yeah. I, I did the translation of the voiceover for that one. I was really happy, uh, but I, ad I adore, they wrote it, I just translated it, but I adore that film. And I adore that film because it puts the kibosh on all those silly arguments. And because what it says is, is there's no magic here. There are no, there's, there's nothing that isn't possible going on. It is constant discussion. And when you constantly discuss reasonably, honestly and openly and with respect for people and their experiences, when you when you put all that stuff together, the answer usually comes out cycling. The answer usually comes out, reduce the dominance of the car and replace people in the space. And, and it's not a historical decision. It's a contemporary process. And that to me was the was that fantastic. Oh, they call it Hracht, uh, the canal. Yeah, absolutely. And I love this shot here. This is just a, a gray day at the, the market. And uh, it, it's because that's the other thing that you hear is like, oh, you know, it, it's it, it's impossible to do because of this or that. Or we, you know, we've got hills or it's too hot or it's too cold or it's too wet. Uh, it's, you know, it, the, the one of my favorite you know, little sayings that uh, that the Dutch say over and over and over again is, you know, there's no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. You're not made of sugar. You're not going to dissolve. You're not going to melt. <laughs> yeah, <I bet laughs> just do it. Jij bent niet van zuiken gemaakt. You are not made of sugar. Yeah. The idea that you effectively that argument says, I'm so uncomfortable with being out in the world that I have to wear a coat made of car. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we didn't wear coats of cars until 50 years ago, well, 70 years ago. The whole of human history hasn't worn coats of cars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally the automobile showed up on the scene about 120 years ago. It wasn't until, you know, literally 80 years ago that it became yeah. commonplace that every household had at least one. Yeah. And look where that's got us. It's not working. Yeah. So 
To close us out, there's a series of photos here that uh, that will end with uh, that same shot that we had of the uh, the the bridge going over uh, the highway. But tell us why you included this series of of three photos because it was a special event. Oh yeah. So this was a cycling festival that Houghton held in 2018, 19, somewhere in there. And it was designed, I talked to Andre about this the other day, you know, exactly what was it? And he was basically saying, we, the proposal for Houghton, as I spoke very early on in our discussion, was to go from an old town of 3,000 up to between 50 and 60,000. And that year we reached our population of 50,000 people. Yeah. And so what they did to celebrate sort of the established place of Houghton of you know, 50,000 people, they had a cycling festival. And one of the things they did was close off a section of the ring road. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about the ring road. The ring road is the main road for cars. You can travel up to 70 kilometers an hour. And it sits just outside a kind of raised barrier of earth. And it wobbles its way around Houghton. And it is the main road that people travel when they come into their little borough. So you go into your borough via the ring road. If you want to go into the little borough next door, you go back out into the ring road along and back into your borough. It's to discourage discourage the, the presence and dominance of cars within the kind of living space. It works very well, but it does mean that it's a space for lots of cars traveling at 70 kilometers an hour. So as part of that celebration, I've just seen guys on the multi-bike at the back there. They were hilarious. That is not normal world. That is not normal Dutchy life. Just letting you know. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, if we zoom in, you'll see, oh yeah, we got a tuba there. <laughs> no, they were glorious. But what this was, was a celebration. Oh, that's myself and my son coming out of one of the little boroughs onto the main ring road. So we were allowed as celebrators of the festival, the cycling festival and 50,000 population, we were allowed to ride on part of that ring road. It was a really interesting experience. I loved doing it. It was beautiful. You saw people of all ages, all abilities, wheelchairs. My, obviously, my son there is on his. What do you call that? What do you call that? He was oh, just that, like scooter. a razor, a push scooter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was on that. You've got people on skates back there. I know there were some ladies in cycling wheelchair next to each other. They were cycling. Um, some of those shots you see dads and moms, and, you know, everyone together. So it was lovely. But it really made me realize that although that was fun, it meant nothing compared to when during the Olympics in Sydney, they closed the expressway over the, where the ferries are. To be allowed to humanize that space, right. that was really powerful. And it made me realize that here in Houghton, that statement doesn't need to be made because we've solved those issues in Houghton. I do not feel repressed or held back by the infrastructure in Houghton. In Sydney, I did. And so to walk that expressway, you know, and some they closed off a lot of the streets during the Olympics. And it was like my husband and I were just saying, gosh, this feels like Europe. You know, this is what we want. So it was a fantastic day. Yeah. And, and, and that's so interesting that you have that, that perspective too, because the open streets events that take place around the globe, uh, the cyclovias, you know, shutting down these major streets and major drags, it is special for, um, for our communities because it, you know, that we don't have the quote unquote, the network, the all ages and abilities facilities that really empower uh, everyone from the, the youngest to the eldest to be able to get around. The ability for somebody in a mobility device, in a, in a wheelchair, to have complete reign of their city without having to get into a, a, a motor vehicle, a, a van or some sort of um, transport device. You know, they can literally get Get there under their own steam. They can just be part of society. And we are so used to thinking of people who want to fit in or people who have to be made space for. This urban design here, it isn't, it's just society. Yeah. 
It's just the rich fabric of society. You mentioned something about children and independence, etc. You know, we talk about that in a slightly throwaway way. We kind of go, oh, it's great that kids are independent and autonomous, etc. But really, the implications of that are really quite enormous. You know, when a young, a two-year-old, and, and apparently this doesn't happen, I can tell you it does every single day. When a two-year-old steps onto what we call in English a walking bike, you know, those balance bikes, they are instantly, instantly having lessons, experiences, which teach them about, yes, ah, there's my rafsters. He very, very early on, so I think he's like two and a half, three there. He very, very early on understood his own body. He understood his own body in physical space. And he very early on learned lessons about social convention, about communications, about his values in a given space. That's about autonomy. That's about respect for self and other. That's about physical bits joining up in the brains. That's about muscles growing. That's about a future citizen understanding their place physically and mentally in the world. And, you know, people might say, oh, that's a bit heavy handed, Kylie. It's not. It's absolutely. When you see a child doing that, you see, I'm boss of the world. Yeah. You know, how often do you see a kid in the back of a car being dragged to sports events or wherever thinking I'm boss of the world? They're thinking I feel brain dead and I'm frustrated. And so I go on a screen, you know, don't get me wrong. My, that, that little boy there turned into a massive screen lover. But he now plays on screens for hours and then we go, oi, outside and chuck him outside. Goodbye. He can go for four hours. No idea where he is. He's as safe, safe as anything. Yeah. And, and active and busy. So I really, really think that that is a change in mindset that has to happen and is facilitated particularly by this design. But I don't think people understand that enough yet. I don't think we, we understand it psychologically, we understand it technically, but we don't actually understand it yet. Yeah. Well, we're so divorced. We're so divorced from that now. If we are in a car dominant society in a car dependent community, we're divorced from that. We don't we don't have that context. I mean, the the fact that, uh, you know, during that ride that I that I took from Utrecht out to Houghton, uh, I commented on the fact that, you know, it was right about the time that that uh, many of the children were, were getting out of school and there, it was just like this constant number, you know, that, that mobility, that independence, the ability to get to places under their own steam, that's completely foreign in, you know, car dependent society. I'm going to pull up the, the map, um, the Google maps, and we'll close out with this because you were just talking about the, you know, that concept of the, the ring roads. And so, when we pull out a bit here, we've got, you know, we've got our major w waterway, the, the canal going uh, down here to the south. And we've got the A12 up up here. We're all, we also see here the farmland, which was also featured in my, in my video, is, is that, uh, you know, there's still preserved working farms, you know, through, you know, just, just the exterior of that. But when we zoom in a little bit, we can see that, yeah, there's... We've got a a circular road that you know goes right around here on the edge, the 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 Rondeveg, right there. And is that what you mean when you're saying the the ring road? Yes, that's that's no 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 that's the ring road. So that ring road is the shape of for for the for the first growth task, so the north, and the second growth task, the south, which I said was still being built, and that creates a shape of eight now. And you can see there's a little green road in the middle where the, where the eight is pinched in at the sides. And that's called, um, well, the coppling, the joining road. So that ring road, you can do kind of just a swirly eight shape all the way around. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I, I thought it would be good because you were talking about it and I, I couldn't quite pull up the, the map quickly enough. I wish I would have had it ready to go uh, because I think that's a that's a really good visual is to be able to, to kind of see exactly what we were talking about there. 
Yeah. And we also saw that, that it's that it's in between the two motorways, so the A27 and the A12. So you can see, oh, you know, this notion that, oh, it's a cycling city, it's, oh, it's, you know, some weird little uh, town on the side that, you know, isn't part of real life. Uh, just, it's not true. This thing is attached to motorways in the center of the country that can take you anywhere. Yeah. Or you catch the train. So you have a train in the south at Costellum and you have a train in the north, which you showed us with that bridge. And that takes you via three stops into the center of Utrecht. It takes 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. And then once you're there, anywhere. <laughs> Amsterdam from my house is, I think, a 50 minute door to door journey. Right. Final, final uh, thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with. Don't believe them when they say it's not possible. It's entirely possible. And not only is it entirely possible, it's here right now. It's functioning highly successfully. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the future. So if you're interested in this, come here. Contact Andre Botemans and or me. I'll have a cup of tea and talk to people quite happily. <laughs> uh, and of course, we've got the project for Het Groen Om Arms, the Green Embrace. Hopefully that will come out in English. So my, my final words are, don't believe them. It is possible. It is indeed. And I'll have all your uh, contact information uh, in the show notes uh, to the podcast, as well as the video description below. Kylie, this has been such an honor and pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. I feel so lucky. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Kylie Van Dam. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up <laughs> and leave a comment down below. Let, let us know if you would be interested in living in a more walkable and bikeable place uh, where the car isn't really dominant uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the streets right out in front of your home. Uh, and if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell to customize your notification preferences. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. But before I let you go, uh, just a quick reminder, if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting the channel. You can make a donation to the nonprofit. You can uh, become a patron on my Patreon account and become one of my Active Towns ambassadors. Uh, or you can make a purchase from the Active Town store. Just go to activetowns.org and you can access all of those channels, all of those links, all of those pages. You know what I mean. <laughs> hey, thank you all so much. We'll see you next time. This is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs>